Hello and welcome. And joining me today to share the stories behind the 10 books that had the biggest influence on his life journey from builder's labourer and wayward teenager to the British Army to his present work as a transpersonal occupational therapist, transformational coach and author, Mick Collins, who's the author of three groundbreaking books on human evolution in a time of global awakening. Mick Collins, welcome. Hi, Sandy. Lovely to be here. Thank you for the invite. Good to have you. So you did not read books during your childhood, adolescence or early adulthood. Was that because you were too busy being wayward? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I had a pretty sort of weird upbringing. So um, comics was my thing. I, I, could, I couldn't really say they were books, but I remember reading The Valiant and I was, you know, as a typical lad, I liked all the sort of robust sort of characters like Captain Hurricane and people like that. Um, so, yeah, that was really as far as I went. I didn't read any books. Obviously, at school, I was taught to read and we would do all that. But, uh, you know, I, I had no connection with books whatsoever, even in adolescence and even in early adulthood, you know. Um, so there was just, yeah, no resonance for it either. I, I, I just don't think I had the capacity, the concentration. I was a very different person to what I am now. You know, I had very low self-esteem, lacking confidence and, you know, so it was a pretty, you know, yeah. Uh, so what tipped it the other way? Um, well, when I started traveling, I mean, I, I went in, as you said, I went into the British Army um, because I'd been wayward and uh, I went, had a few court appearances and that was brought up some difficult things. And, uh, you know, it's pretty much said to me that my next, you know, the last court appearance would be possibly a custodial sentence. So I was really then, I think, it brought me up sharp. So I decided to tell the judge I wanted to join the British Army. <laughs> and um, and he said, well, look, I can't make you, but, um, you know, I think if you want to do that, and he gave me a fine. So I, I, I honoured that, and I joined the Army. Um, didn't really any books there, one or two, but they were mainly kind of war books because I was in the infantry. So, you know, kind of a couple of things, I can't really say it was very, very gripping books, but... Um, uh, it wasn't until I left the army that I started meeting hippies and I became one myself and, um, you know, it was the 70s and they would start reading me poetry, <laughs> which is from an ex-soldier's point of view was a bit like, it felt really weird. Um, but then I started reading Herman Hesse and I just absolutely loved it. Narzis and Goldman, it reminded me of a friendship that um, I of somebody I met on the kibbutz and it, it, I just felt like there was a real resonance. I saw um, uh, Narzis and Goldman like in, in the relationship with my friend almost. There was something. Um, mm. Yeah, and Khalil Gibran. So and then I started to think, oh, you know, this is great. So, so books became things that started to teach me something rather than just, you know, the, the few I'd read in the army were just gratuitous and really not that interesting. <laughs> Was it the books that woke you up? They were the beginning of it. I mean, I was still pretty wild, even when I was traveling, you know, sort of, um, uh, I, there was a there was a long period of six years before I ended up in a Buddhist monastery that, um, you know, I was sort of going through a process of refinement. Um, and yes, books, you know, I read um, uh, Swami Prabhutava, The Science of Self-Realization, didn't understand a word of it, but, I was just trying to have a little look at that because a lot of people were reading this stuff. So that was uh, like on a kibbutz. That's what was going around. So you yes. get given these books. And um, and yeah, so I think there was a thing that started to churn. I started to, uh, you know, I remember um, traveling to the east and then getting a, you know, sort of books on poetry there and starting to put. My, I didn't really understand it, if I'm honest, but something was beginning to land yeah and it wasn't until a friend of mine ended up uh, going to live in a monastery and he was a very good friend of mine that um i decided one day just to go and see him so i came back to the uk and uh I, for a two-day visit i ended up staying three years in that place and that's when books really took hold yeah they really to mean something because I, I had to study a bit more there you know so it wasn't just random reading there was a sort of a process to it. So how easy or how challenging was it for you to pick just him? 
Oh, incredible. I mean, I, I, I was, you know, getting neurotic at one point. I thought you know, <laughs> sort of, I was shuffling these books around. And, and, and yet what's really interesting, that uh, they sort of became self-selecting in a way because I, I thought, well, I could talk about the book, which, but I wanted to talk about the book in relation to my life story. <laughs> then it became obvious which ones were the ones yes. um, but there could have been you know many many for each category of that journey you know there are lots of categories of books but um yeah so the ones i i chose were um pretty much telling that journey of, of my own inner journey if you wish and some of the points of awakening and this disassociation if you wish as well that happened yeah Okay, well, let's start with the first book, which is yeah. Wisdom Energy. Yeah. Two Tibetan Lamas on a Lecture Tour in the West. Yes, by yes. Lama Thupten Thupten Yeshe. Thupten Yeshe, yeah, and Lama Zopa. Now, I've got this one, which is, I think, the early prototype for that one. So um, this might slightly be, because this is Wisdom Energy 2. Ah. So this now that is, didn't come up in a search when I looked for it. I, I looked as well and it didn't, and, I, and that one did. Um, and I think I do know that one, but I, it's been a long time since I've read that. But this was the one that really started to catalyze um, some real connections to Buddhism. Uh, yeah, but I think actually it's the prototype for the one that we've got on the, on the screen. Mm. Yeah, because it was published by um, the same company, uh, Wisdom Publications um and is uh yeah it's pretty much you know lama yeshi's work yeah so is, is this list in chronological order is this the first yes. book that really impacted you it it impacted because i had to start somewhere um, i i ended up in this buddhist monastery like i say for a two-day visit um and then when they found out i had some building skills because i'd been a laborer a builder's laborer for some time they said, well, do you want to stay on the building team? You know, 200 mock Gothic mansion, 200 room mock Gothic mansion. So I said, yeah, why not? So, you know, uh, you know, 10 pound a month, all your meals free and um, a clothing allowance, you know, which was pitiful. But I thought, great deal. You know, it's macrobiotic food, 1983. Um, so I thought, why not? <laughs> you know, I stayed there just under three years. And but the, obviously these massive teachings are really quite, you know, sort of esoteric. Uh, yes. I don't really have a clue what was going on. So wisdom energy was just like a, a brilliant drop in. So started to get to understand the, the concept of bodhicitta, uh, non-duality, renunciation, you know, non all that. You started to get a feel for what's going on here. You know, it's, um, and I liked Lama Yeshi's approach because he wasn't, dogmatic uh, he passed um he passed away in 1984 but or did, was it 83 i can't remember i never met him but he set the monastery up he was the founder of the monastery uh but by all accounts a beautiful man a really beautiful man um and yeah so the the journey into that book was a way of really trying to uh sort of familiarize myself with what I, what i was investing my time and energy into um and there were some real lovely moments, actually, because they talk about relative truth and ultimate truth uh, in terms of existence. So you get the sense that you've got a conventional sense of Mick, but ultimately Mick doesn't exist. And I'm thinking, OK, you know, scratching the head. <laughs> so how does this work? Um, but that, that became, for me, because I, I discovered from having left school at 15 with no education whatsoever and a pretty poultry education at that, um, that I had a, an inquiring mind. And this was a real beginning of that. It was really quite something, you know, when you're 27 and you just discover a part of yourself that you didn't know existed. What was that like? Incredible. You know, that, um, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I used to have some very self-depreciating comments about my, my I'd call myself sort of things, you know, thick neck and stuff like that, you know, and, uh, you know, and I was, it was all done with humour, but it was self-depreciating. And then realising that I was going into uh, these books and starting to understand it and then thinking and reading Ken Wilber, 
some of those early books on Ken Wilber and starting to think, OK, I can sort of track this. And it was it was quite satisfying, you know, and it led to me becoming ultimately in the end an academic, which I never would have imagined, you know. Yeah, changed your whole view of yourself. Totally. I mean, it was a, a pretty, you know, from having a pretty, you know, difficult teenage and early life and with criminality and no education, really, you know, I was pretty, um, wasn't well served by that particular process. And then, you know, finding yourself in this, um, yeah, in this <laughs> eventual academic sort of background. So this was the beginning of that, actually. That was the beginning of that. So that, that's quite an awakening then, to suddenly discover something about yourself that's so different from how you've lived your life. And, uh, you know, there was something beautiful about the, you know, the idea then that you're actually investing your time and energy into something worthwhile that, yeah. you know, you're not just going out and just getting loads of material possessions. You're actually looking at your karmic propensities, your glaciers, you know, whatever you've brought forth that needs clearing, um, you know, looking at cyclic existence and, you know, all that stuff. And you think, wow, you know, this is a real uh, and I did it seriously. I mean. I used to lead Manjushri Puja in the mornings. Um, so, you know, I wasn't, by the time I embedded myself in the community, I was, you know, really quite involved in doing the building work and then going to the evening teachings, doing the pujas in the morning and doing a lot of meditation. And yeah, so it, it was a, a, it became a whole path, you know. Um, but, but of course, um, as you'll be aware from uh, what I wrote, that, that the, uh, unexpected uh, thing that happened was I I mean they did the higher tantras there like Vajragini, Haruka and all those big tantric and I, I didn't take them I thought I'm quite happy doing Manjushri and Chenrezy and doing the lower ones because I just thought be be gentle with yourself I don't understand half of what they're talking about so I'll be better off just doing the low level stuff and in my mind taking a sort of a precautious but you know cautionary approach um but but that didn't seem to stop what <laughs> wanted to come up which was a, a quite a big if you wish kundalini uh, experience um which totally shocked me and it was a, a massive experience like that so uh you know, I was doing lots of mantra. I was traveling to see some friends in in the west country and I was doing some mantra on the train and I've spoken about this for, before publicly, but the, you know, this uh, blissful state just opened up and I felt complete love for everyone on the train. I mean, it's overwhelming. And as I've often said, it, it was like a full body orgasm. You know, I was just in radiating bliss and love. And it went on for a couple of days. I mean, it wasn't just a fleeting thing. It just went on and on. And... Um, in the end, I almost wanted it to stop because it was <laughs> too overwhelming. I wasn't prepared for that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but when it did go down, uh, then I started to find, I, I mean, Michael Washburn, who's a transpersonal philosopher, talks about the eclipse of the ego. And I think that's what happened. I think somehow this, uh, all, all that was been opened up in the channels. So lots of unresolved shadow stuff uh, came up, lots of, really difficult things violent and murderous impulses i mean it was a shocking uh, altered and extreme state of consciousness so i had to leave the monastery and go to north wales to just hang out and just take stock you know so that was a uh, what turned out to be well you know i could say oh that's that was really difficult but in fact it was part of the evolutionary process <clears throat> it had to happen yeah uh, so you know um I, so yeah it was hard to be with because um stan groff hadn't and christina groff hadn't published their book at that time that came out in 89 um there was very little written about this stuff uh most uh, the people in the in the monastery didn't know what to do even the teacher the resident teacher you know was a bit, a bit lost for words um and it was tricky. It was very tricky. So, uh, you know, I, I was in a bit of a bad state with all this eruption going on. Mm. Thinking, what am I supposed to do now, you know? Um, and being totally paranoid as well. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a big deal, you know, a big, a big part of the awakening. But I now look back on it and think, ah, oh, that needed to happen. 
that needed yeah. to. Mm. Yeah. So, um, book two is yeah. Freedom from the Known by Krishnamurti. That mm. was published in 1969. Yeah. Um, interesting because that's exactly what you experienced. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's incredible. I was very blessed because one of the people I'd met in the monastery um, had been a former mendicant and he'd been a, a, a very close associate with Krishnamurti for many years. His son uh, was a monk in the monastery, so he used to come and visit. Um, and he, um, I'm just aware I'm going off screen, he, um, he basically, we, we became quite good friends and, you know, it was always lovely to talk to him. You know, beautiful man you know, sort of lovely Indian chap with a lovely, lovely long beard. And he looked really wise and kind, you know, and the sort of person that you just feel really comfortable with. And he heard that I would sort of just quickly bolted out the monastery. And he said, well, where's Nick? And they said, oh, he's kind of, you know, having some kind of breakdown or something, you know. Um, but he basically found out where I was through a, a mutual friend and got a message to me, obviously no internet or in those days uh we didn't have a phone in the house um and somebody got a little uh, message to me and said if you want to talk you know come and see me so so i, I did I, I managed to go to shropshire where he lived and we had a chat and and he he sat down and he said what you do you're passing you're passing through a, a transformation and you got to think when you've got all this murderous stuff coming up that's that it's what a god thing. yeah very heavy and I thought, what a godsend that somebody just said, if you can tolerate this, if you can just get through it. And he said, um, you know, and what a lifeline that was, because, you know, I, I was contemplating suicide. I was really so down on everything. And I didn't have a lot of self-esteem anyway, you know, so you can imagine all this coming up. I just felt like the epitome of evil. I thought I was possessed. You know, I couldn't get this stuff out of me. It was just horrific. Um so he basically, um, he, he just gave me a, a real lifeline of his kindness. And he, the fact that even with somebody who's raging with murderous thoughts, he, he would let me sleep in his house. And he even left his bedroom door open. I went to the toilet at night and his bedroom door was open. And I felt that was such an endorsement in me <laughs> that, you know, he didn't lock his door. You know, uh, I, I, somehow that type of kindness just goes deep and it, you know, resonates. So, um, yeah, so I, I then thought, right, if he recommends Krishnamurti, which he did, then I'm going to have a look. So I did. And um, it, there was something liberating about it because all of the conventions of Buddhism were, you know, you, you, you do this and you follow your teacher and you get this advice. And, and all of a sudden I felt I'd, like a slippery pea popped out of the, you know, I, I, somehow I couldn't locate where I'm supposed to be and what I'm doing, you know. It felt very, uh, but Christian Murphy was like pretty much, well, just be with what is, just attend to that with choiceless awareness. And oh, there was something great. And, he, and the way that he would say, well, society is just, you know, this isn't really what reality is. So he was actually challenging society. And I felt like the same one. <laughs> you know, mm. That's how the book landed in me. And I thought, wow, ah. Oh, it was like I could breathe a bit, you know, because yeah. uh, he would say, look at your look at your base impulses. Look at your violence. Look at where you are. That. And I thought, yes, I'm in it. I, can, <laughs> I didn't have any problems finding that. I was consumed by it. So uh, there was something about that, you know, that I just thought, wow. And I it, it just enabled me to be sort of a bit more present, you know, without feeling I'm some sort of aberration that needs to be locked up because that's what I thought needed to happen. Uh, so I kept my head down. I didn't work for two years. I couldn't. And anyone who knows me well will know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a real grafter. That's one thing I will say. I don't shirk. <laughs> and for me not to work for two years was quite something. And you know? I just, uh, I couldn't do it. I just could not be in the presence of too much organisation and, and what have you. I had some friends and I met people casually you know for um, maybe a, a light chat but not many <laughs> you know it's mainly going in going internally but i think what krishnamurti gave me more than anything was um that his idea that the religious mind is different from religious belief 
and that we really need to go into the um, choiceless awareness, the observer is the observed and all that stuff. And then I thought I had a practice. I had something I could really hold on to, you know. So it's, again, a real lifesaver. Mm. Yeah, an anchor, sounds like. An anchor, but one of the things <laughs> he said, and uh, I, I had to remind myself in the book, you know, we can all have marvellous experiences, but the person who's having them can be completely deluded. <laughs> I don't know, that just made me laugh. And I thought, brilliant, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, I'd had the marvellous experience with the bliss, and here I was completely messed up. And I thought, great, this is speaking to me. So it helped me to be honest with what was going on. But one of the things he said is um, that there needs to be a mutation in the psyche. The West needs a mutation in the psyche. And then I, th I was like, wow, okay, you know, I felt in that mutation because something was being cleared out. I didn't know quite what was coming because, um, you know, Stan and Christina hadn't written their book and it wasn't obvious quite what the process was, but I felt part of something um, that was uh, in some sort of mutation, uh, mutated process. Yeah, so... Uh, I think Freedom from the Known was, you know, and The Impossible Question was another book and The Ending of Time with um, David Bone. Those those were real critical books for me from Krishnamurti. Mm. Um, yeah, just to attend to what is and just to see what's in you and actually don't jump off the spot, just be with it and, you know. Uh, yeah, that, that was a, a real lifesaver. So book three on your list is Spiritual Emergency, When Personal yeah. Transformation Becomes a Crisis by Stanislav and Christina Groff. So yeah. when did that book come into your life? How long did you have well, to wait for it? Yeah, it, well, it, it came out in 1989. I didn't get it straight away. It was a little bit after that when I, um, I was then sort of relatively fit enough to go and I realised that what I'd been through was giving me a vocation. So I, I sort of went to a local college to go and get some credentials, you know, sort of diploma so I could go on to university. So I'd already now, I was coming through the worst of it. I was still very vulnerable, um, but it was, you know, I was beginning to um, be able to get more with myself and get out there. And a friend of mine, uh, one of them was an anaesthetist that did hypnotherapy who was very much into Arnie Mindell, and another one was a transpersonal uh, who was training to be a transpersonal psychologist. And he put me onto this book. Um, and we obviously we're still good friends now. But um, once I got wind that this was out, I then looked at it and I was thinking, oh, wow, <laughs> this is right. So then it became something more empowering now that, that you know, I, I still felt very shy about it. I, most of the people that knew me were sworn to secrecy, not to tell anyone, because I was going into the health field and people don't speak about stuff like this, you know? I mean, it's not the common discourse. So I, I thought I need, I felt vulnerable. So I asked all my um, close friends just to keep it really tight. Don't tell anyone what I've been through. Um, so there was a lot of good friends that have been holding that for a good few years. Um, but that was, that was a, a, a validation. That was a validation, that book. And, um, you know, just knowing that, there's something um, that uh, John Weir Perry, who's in the book, who I particularly love, um, I had been dipping into Jung at this time, and I didn't put a, a Jungian book in early because I'll be coming to one of those later, which has a, a, a bigger significance, but I was already dipping into Jung. Um, and uh, there was something about John Weir Perry that really spoke to me when he said that the, the, the level of archetype um, is activated. Uh, in this process uh, it, with this Kundalini awakening and um, that this is a potential for renewal John Weir Perry is very big on the renewal process through altered and extreme states like this so when I read that chapter I thought oh wow you know wow I can really see the depths that are coming through Lee Sonella in there writes about Kundalini um, and that gave me some real insights because I had these very weird vibrations going through my body and intense heat in the hara and that explained it because he said these are common symptoms that, are, that go with this experience um rd lang oh when i read lang <laughs> i already knew i wanted to go and work in mental health because i thought oh, 
I want to go and train to be a therapist. And, and so I read Ronnie Lang in that. Day. And, you know, um, he, he actually said that actually most of society, it's a pseudo sanity. It's not actually sanity at all. And I just, I was reading this, like cracking up, laughing, thinking, wow, this is great. You know, this is really what's needed to break out of this constriction that, um, and for people like myself and others who've been having these wake ups like that, who end up in a hospital. Uh, you know, and misdiagnosed and mistreated. Um, so yeah, that um, that idea then that that that, that, that there's a, a pseudo sanity. And he, in another book, um, uh, which is in the Journal of Contemplative Psychotherapy, he writes about a schizo cosmos. Uh, you know that actually we've created this this split cosmos, and it's just not healthy. And in fact, the piece that he wrote was the hatred of health. That we hate health. We don't want real health if we're, you know, medicating these sort of processes and dumbing them down. So I, I was really excited to read that book because I was just on the beginning of starting to think this is the way I'm heading. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, that was great. Um, yeah, I suppose in a way there was um, an implicit element in there which was like death and rebirth. That was another thing that came up as a theme. That you know something's trying to die, but something's trying to live. So that yes. new process, I really felt that because um, I know some part of me died in that in that past um, in that experience I had. You know, I, I, could, I just couldn't ever live my life differently again. I mean, that I, I was in, initiated into something. That's the right word. It was an initiation, and. I played a sort of a surface game with people out there and just like, oh, I'm Mick, you know, da, 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 and all the social stuff that you do. But internally, all I was reading was about archetypes and consciousness and transformation and transpersonal, because that, that's all that interested me. But it doesn't, it, at the time, it didn't interest a huge amount of people out there. Yeah. You were lucky. Hmm. So, so yeah. the book that came after that, uh, maybe, yeah. is... Dream Body, the body's Dream role body. in revealing the self, Arnold the Mindell. Marvellous man in the universe, Arnie Mindell, um, who, who I absolutely adore. Uh, yeah, uh, Arnie's a, um, a Jungian analyst, but he, um, he was a, a training analyst in Zurich in the Jungian centre there. And um, he worked with Marie-Louise von Franz, Barbara Hanna, Franz Ricklin, who are the, you know, key people in Jung's life. And he was uh, having therapy with them three, <laughs> which is great. And he, he then sort of had this thing about the body and the subtle body, the subtle energies, you know, and he called his work the dream body. And, um, and then started to really get into, you know, uh, exploring that and researching it. And... Um, Ah, oh, that was just tremendous because, again, it was actually um, the, the same friend of mine that put me onto Groff, actually put me onto Mindell. <laughs> and so uh, I just thought, OK, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll have a little look at Mindell. And I straight away, I just thought this is great because it was a, a book that was mythic. It was deep. It was archetypal. It was looking at the Kundalini process and the subtle body. It was looking at, you know, how... Um, psych soma and world are connected and because he was a quantum he did um theoretical physics and studied mm -hmm. quantum um, work at mit um he actually went to zurich to be studying physics and uh he sat next to um a chat but it was uh, and he just said oh what do you he, out of the blue he just said what do you think of dreams and it happened to be the president of the young institute <laughs> so he said i think they're very interesting we should talk again <laughs> And then he became a training a union analyst, you know, in training. Um, so I think when I read um, Arnie's work, there was just something, I felt like I'd come home to something really quite profound because he was taking everyone's experiences seriously and that um, you get this idea that if something's coming up in us, it's an emergent property and it should be welcomed and it will have some wisdom. The dream body is about wisdom and it will show us something. And it felt so healthy um, that I couldn't help but fall in love with it. And then I found a way to becoming a student of that, um, you know, uh, of that tradition. It's a process work for about uh, from 19, 
96 to 2004 or 5. Uh, yeah, 5. Which is great. These books really did um, form your path, didn't they? Unbelievable. Uh, well, you know, I mean, when I think about it, I mean, the thing that really fascinates me is is the dreaming and the mystical, you know, mysticism is is big for me. And Arnie's, you know, he doesn't shy away from that. He, he, he goes into the numinous. Um, and when I read that Arnie uh, had written about the numinous and I, I loved Jung's take on the numinous from Rudolf Otto's work, the idea of the holy, uh, the mysterium tremendum, the mysterium fascinens, that these things really can cook you up and you, you know, big opening experiences. But when I saw Arnie writing about the numinous, I thought, wow, the way he's put this together is just like mind blowing. So I kind of went off and, but interestingly, before I'd read Dream Body, I had a dream of a black snake and out of the black snake's mouth came a white snake. And I had no idea what it meant. And then I looked in um, Dream Body as I was reading it, and he said, oh, the, the, there's a fairy tale to do with the white snake, and it's all about transformation of reality. <laughs> and straight away, all of a sudden, I'm just thinking, I've got to go to this training. You know, I've got to uh, drop into this. And, um, yeah, and I was very lucky that uh, some of the seminars I attended, he has um, like maybe, you know, hundreds of people attending, and, Occasionally, people get asked to, if they'd like to work in the middle of the group. With And so Arnie and Amy, uh, his wife, they said, oh, would you like to come and work in the middle of the group on something that interests you? And so I worked on the, the murderousness that I experienced. <laughs> now, that was really important because that's the first time I'd actually gone public in a big way with it, in a, in a context where I didn't know everyone in the room, and hundreds of people. And I went into it and oh, I was really freaked out, if I'm honest. But what I, I learned so much from it because I was telling my story and he was listening to the auditory information, but they were watching for other channels. And they, they got a very good way of training and, uh, to watch how those uh, expressive channels are trying to be uh, um, communicated. But because of our limitations and our beliefs in a certain way of being, we don't often attend to them. And they noticed there were some movements and they asked me to amplify the movements. And so I did. And next minute I was just in this energetic <laughs> going all over the place. And I got this incredible insight uh, that, you know, it was really liberating uh, from being someone who needs to go around with a secret and all cramped up to really expressing that. And, and you know, there's an energetic element here that's beyond words. And that was a major turning point, you know. So, uh, you know, you can understand why I feel so blessed to, uh, you know, all these beautiful people that drop in and <laughs> help yeah. you on the way. Yeah. yeah. What a friend of mine calls the crystals on your path. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm. Some little sparkles and jewels that sort of, yeah. Yeah. Mm, indeed. So book number five is the Red Book by wow. Carl Jung. Comes well, up pretty well, frequently. I've got the big one, but um, it's just too big to put in. So I've got, I've got the reader's version as well, which, um, and uh, yeah, I've read this one four times. And each time I just think, I, I felt like I haven't read it the previous time. You know, it's, it's a bit like, wow, I miss so much. But um, that, when it came out in 2009, I, I, was, I was at the university then. I was now an academic. I'd left... Um, I didn't talk about that, but I worked in mental health in the field of um, acute admissions and psychological therapies. Um, and eventually then I, I ended up in um, working at the university, you know, teaching. And the Red Book came out. I was already writing academic papers on um, the types of things we're talking about here. And I was getting quite prolific and getting them out. And I, on one paper in 2008, I spoke about my own story and what happened. I didn't say I had murder of sorts because it was just over my edge, but I said violent. And, you know, it took me a while, quite a while to get to be able to say murderous because, you know, uh, I mean, thankfully, my wife is a forensic therapist. So, you know, she keeps me in check. <laughs> but uh, but the idea is that's over the cultural edge and it freaks people out. And I didn't want to do that. And I didn't want to be, you know, sort of labeled, if you wish, as, you know, something. Mm. So, 
it's a process. It's not one thing you just do once and that's it. You you attend to this gradually. But Jung's Red Book, um, when I read that, <laughs> I just thought, wow, here he is taking the lid off the whole shaboodle. And, you know, he's he, he meets all uh, Salome and uh, Elijah. These, he has these biblical references in there, which are pretty way out. He meets his inner psychiatrist who then has a sort of a quasi-diagnostic dialogue with him. <laughs> and Jung's kind of like, oh, he, he realises it's his own inner straitjacket psychiatrist because he was a psychiatrist. So he then, you know, he's dealing with his inner archetypes that are uh, very resonant with him. He meets Philemon, his, his daemon. Um, but the thing that really, really touched me about this was um, I was reading, I was reading the book and then I saw uh, he had a vision of a, a black snake going into the orifice of a, of a cruci lower orifice of a crucified figure and going through the body and coming out of the mouth as a white snake. Now, can you imagine, I told you the dream that I had about the black snake yeah. and the white snake, and I thought, wow, these archetypes, they're desperately trying to be lived in us, you know? I mean, I, I hadn't read that anywhere. He'd never published the Red Book. Uh, this was brand new, and I'd already been working on my own black snake, white snake dream, you know? And I, I kind of thought, well, actually, the black snake's really significant because, you know, we got to go into the deep. We have to go into the dark. We have to go to the primer materia. We have to be cooked and we have to meet that stuff. And then, and then you get into this transformative reality, so the white snake. So when I read that in the red book, I thought, oh, what? It's like it, for everyone that's been through a spiritual crisis that didn't know what to make of it or how to speak about it. Jung's work doesn't um, marry up with everybody's experience, but it's enough to show that there's a, a, a sort of a, a process that happens that people can resonate with and understand, and oh, that was such a such an incredible book. So it really, really did make me feel. Then in two thousand and nine, I, I, again, I just keep going deeper and deeper. I'm really going to own this and have no shame about it. You know, I mean, it's not normal academic discourse to be talking about this stuff over dinner. You know, but um, one or two people I started to tell. You know, and we. And, and it, it kind of broke that idea that consensus reality is only full of people that are just straight jacketed. Well, they're not. Uh, but the, uh, the fantasy is sometimes when you want to protect yourself, you think they are. But um, so Professor Tim O'Riordan, who's a, a emeritus professor up there, I mean, he loved my work, you know, which I, I said, oh, wow. And so he wrote the forward for my three books, you know, and he's just said, I love it, you know. And when you have some validation like that, you know, from a beautiful human being, you just think, wow, you can start to own your story. Mm. And, you know, and I've always felt being up front with this stuff is I'm not doing, I mean, it, I always feel a bit embarrassed when I talk about this. I do it because it, if there's somebody else listening that's going through that, they'll think, oh, you know, that's another person that I can, I've got a reference for that I'm not alone. And, mm. You know that that feels important to me. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah, more uh, so today than it's ever been. Yes, indeed, and and you know the the idea that somehow you know because I mean it will lead on in a minute. I know we're going to go into Thomas Berry, which is a brilliant segue, but actually the world in crisis will elicit more spiritual crises, and that's a fact. That is going to happen. We're already getting eco anxiety. Um, but it, you know, as it hots up, we're going to get more of this. So we, we need to help each other and resource each other. But one of my favourite things about the Red Book that I absolutely love is is seeing the genesis of active imagination. The thing that he, the thing that he really got as a method, uh, uh, which I think is a spiritual practice. Um, I did. I was doing it today in a meadow barefoot over the over the road and <laughs> just doing some active imagination in, out in the woods. Uh, and we've got a woodland with a meadow nearby uh, because I had a body sensation that I needed to work on. So I was, you know, shouting and screaming and doing all sorts of dance and and out it came. It's uh, so you can see where Mindell and Jung dance beautifully around this sort of process. Um, 
Yeah, but seeing how active imagination was being formed in in the writing of the Red Book, there, it's, there's a method that is just brilliant, you know. Um, yeah, so wonderful. And and again, like I say, that one of the things that you get with reading the Red Book is that you know this is a deeply religious process. I think you know, and I mean that word in the way that Krishnamurti went. Talk, talked about not not just belief but you know actuality you're in it and the word that i feel i used to feel shy talking about but these days i feel very clear about is that is the word the holy and uh there's something about reclaiming that and and not being shy to talk about it you know it's uh, not just spiritual it's actually holy and yeah. you know beautiful so the red book really sung that for me massively <laughs> mm. so book number six is the great work our way into the future by thomas berry one of the most eminent yeah. cultural historians of our time and that one was published in 1999 yeah and what what, what an amazing book you know um, in, in the book one of the ways uh, he describes um, the creation myth was in the beginning was the dream <laughs> You know, uh, not just the word, not just the logos, but the dream. Yeah. And, you know, he was a he was a, a, a monk, um, which uh, not, not a lot of people know. I see him as a sort of an eco theologian, you know, sort of. Um, but you can see that he's got this real sense of history and this sense of time. And he talks about the Cen the Cenozoic 65 million years worth of evolution. And then he, he said, we're now in the Ecozoic. You know, we need a completely new way of doing life, participatory, healing, connected. And wow, you know, when you read that, you just, you know, I mean, you, like, like, for instance, he would say um, carbon is spiritual. And you only think about carbon reduction and um, things like that, which is right. Yeah, we need to sort of, manage that but if we saw it as spiritual rather than something that's pesky and needs to be harnessed like a naughty sort of you know molecule but if we saw it as spiritual we might use it differently you know you might sort of think wow this is a precious commodity this is a you know something really let's be thoughtful how we use carbon it would just radically change the way we live so you know just that one statement that you know carbon is spiritual it's I mean, I think that's revolutionary. You know, it's uh, it would uh, it's not. Of course, we need to reduce our carbon, but if we saw it as spiritual, as something that is something, you know, really holy and needing real care in the way we use um, carbon and the way we, well, I mean, we are carbon, <laughs> so we are spiritual. Um, but his his view, I mean, you know the. Um, well, he'd done a lovely book with Brian Swime on the, on the universe, which is great. And that was quite something. But what I love about the great work is when he, he's got a vision for something massive, uh, like the, uh, the cosmological um, element of this. And, and he talks about the great self and the individual self being fulfilled through each other. So it, it almost has echoes of Jung's ego self axis, the self with a capital S, transpersonal but this great self and the individual self are fulfilled through each other so it means we've got to be transpersonal we've got to really open up to this tremendous um uh you know life potential that we have so i see the spiritual emergence work very strongly connected to thomas berry mm. uh, and I, I think i've been doing some of that work in my writing you know that's where i've been going with it yeah yeah well Number seven might seem like a little bit of a... A little bit more about Berry on just one thing that I think is really key. I, I, I just, uh, I did make, an, uh, just, uh, sorry to say that, but one of the things he said was um, that we need the wisdom from indigenous people, uh, the feminine, uh, our traditional um, uh, spiritual traditions, we shouldn't write them off, and science, and I would include Jung as in that science as well, not just straightforward empirical research. And I think that is amazing, um, is, you know, that there he is as a sort of a, a monk in a tradition like that, and he's calling on a real 
expansive view, you know, really way ahead of his time. Yeah. And I know now we've got rewilding is very big in the world and, you know, it's just great. But if you read Berry, he was way ahead of the curve. Yeah, you know, he said the wild is sacred and actually our dreaming is our wildness. You know, so if we're rewilding, we've really got to do our work in in there. But not just it's not just about growing dreadlocks and, you know, sitting around a campfire and feeling connected to nature. It's part of that, of course, but it's about how we attend to the dreams, the tricky ones, the really difficult dreams and the beautiful dreams. So I think this is really you know kind of deep work and that doesn't mean you can see someone who's in a business suit who could be doing that rewilding you know that's what i kind of like about barry he's really giving us a um a, a way forward i think to pick these pivotal things up that need to happen at this time yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay so book number seven um bit of a change here with testimony yeah. of light yeah testimony of light uh, i mean i love this uh i love this book because um yeah it's it's a step change from all the other stuff because uh mm. it's um it's now looking at someone who's a medium who's um uh getting messages from a former friend yeah. passed over uh francis banks and she was a nun for I think, 22 years and was deeply devotional woman and uh, she passed away because of cancer and um and all of a sudden helen greaves starts getting these messages from, <laughs> from her friend who's passed and you, you've got to write a book and she's a classic introvert i don't you know she's sort of like oh right <laughs> you know so she then starts to think oh, i've got to so she started getting the information and, and recording it and I, it almost um it, it seems to bring alive the near-death research in a really interesting way because um, you, you've got someone that's giving a commentary <laughs> on all the different things that are going on, you know, over a period of time. Um, and one of the things I loved was um, when she said, uh, you know, when you die, you just you, you take with you what all of your habits and your mental formations just pass over with you. So... That's one injunction to get working. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's, uh, while we're here on earth, that's a really important message. Um, and, you know, she talks very intimately about the life review and what it means. And she gives a couple of examples of that. Um, one is a surgeon that, um, uh, yeah, actually ends up, um, who used to pray to this spirit there was a surgeon spirit that would actually guide him. He did some beautiful operations. And this spirit was always helping him do these operations. And before he did the surgery, he used to pray and ask for a connection. And then one day he ended up having an affair with someone and he had a row with his lover and he came in and he didn't do his prep and he was discombobulated and the patient died. And he went into a spiral. His wife found out. She So the marriage ended. He went into some terrible state, started taking medication to feel better, but actually ended up becoming addicted and ended up dying. And she talks about his journey on the other side, about his life review and his learning through that. It's quite something, you know, because um, you get this idea that uh, he was told you, you, you should have actually got to know that spirit a bit better and your own spirit. Uh, and that, um, but he was also credited for doing some beautiful work as well, and it wasn't all bad and no judgment or anything, it's all learning. So, yeah, I really love that book. And, um, was it the first book you'd read about life after death? No, I'd read um Raymond Moody's work many years ago, but I don't think it landed in the way that it this one, did. yeah, yeah, yes, because I read Ray Moody sometime and i was still you know i i tend i tend to take a while to deepen you know i need i need years i, I don't get it straight away sometimes so um yeah but that was the one that had a major impact on me this this book mm. yeah uh, yeah the, the the it's the first um i know the old adage about atonement and at one moment um but that was the first time i read that and i liked it i thought that was nice <laughs> yeah Bearing in mind it was written in the 60s as well. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. So book number eight. Yeah. Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles, Marianne Williamson. Yeah. Lo- a classic. Lo- oh. Modern classic. Yeah. More or less. I, yeah. One of the things that I really picked up in my life uh, as I started progressing and working was just how tricky love was and is. It doesn't come easy. Um, you know, relatively kind and compassionate, you know. But uh, I don't think I was really one for feeling love and I didn't really know what it is and was. Um, You know, that came a bit later in life, uh, but only little bits of it. I had the big experience on the train, but I'm talking about in, you know, relationships where I'm not just in a state of oneness and bliss, just the everyday. And, And I thought, yeah, this book, I... It called to me, and I thought I'll I'll read it. I I heard somebody had read it and loved it, so I I thought I'd take a punt on it. And it was absolutely breathtaking. Uh, I love her honesty, her vulnerability in the book. She talks about her own sort of um, feeling awful, and that everybody seemed to know the meaning of life except her, <laughs> you know. And and then one day she just decided and again she also used the word god which i liked and i noticed i i like that term and um yeah it was nice to see it used and so i i sort of thought this is this is lovely and then she asked for a miracle and and then things started to change you know she started to to work to um becoming um working through fear and all the things that she says fear warps us which i think it does Mm. and yeah, and then what is you know the, the idea that miracles are intercessions for our holiness, you know, and things like that. I think, wow, that's so beautiful. So I kind of, um, yeah, I really fell in love with that book, and you know, and, and, and funny enough, choosing it for this, it's made me want to read it again, which I think I will do uh, in once I finish the current book I'm reading. But um, yeah, that idea that, um, and also she speaks about. Um, the, the, the time we're living in, she also talks about atonement and forgiveness and that a lot of that's needed. And I like the way she spoke about the, the feminization, uh, you know, the spirituality, if it's going to work, is going to be uh, through the feminization of men and women. And, and I really resonated with that. You know, there's some, yeah, some, some deep connections with that. That book comes up fairly often as well yeah so book number nine is the early fathers from the philokalia translated by kadlubovsky and palmer yes. Pardon? and palmer yes and palmer who i think actually was a, a gurdjieffian i've got a feeling I've, I've seen his name pop up before elsewhere and I'm, i don't know about that but i might need to go and check that out so um yeah uh, yes uh so i kind of uh, I've always been interested in mystics, and um, this uh, this particular book called to me because I was I was reading um, the Way of the Pilgrim, and um, which I absolutely adored. I thought that was a just such a brilliant book, um, and I was studying the um, some of the Orthodox monks like um, Saint Pacius of, of Mount Athos, and some extraordinary things going on there, and the Philokalia kept popping up so I thought right I, I, I better get into this and have a little look and and um, it just you know when you think you're going back now to the third century and AD and you're you're getting these pearls of wisdom uh, you know that talking about conscience and talking about managing our impulses for good and evil and angelic doing I thought wow this is brilliant you know so they're really connected with, you know, this this path of, um, you know, taking great care with how you live your life, with what you do with it. And uh, St. Anthony writes about praying uh, with his eyes, with his ears, with his nose, with his mouth, with his hands, his feet, his stomach. And that's how he prays. So don't take too much food. You know, let that be your prayer. And, I'm, I, you know, you think, Wow. You know, this is a, a real gem, and uh, I can understand why. Um, in the way of the pilgrim, the guy who is an anonymous 
uh, person who wrote it. Um, we don't know who wrote it, but um, all he had was the uh, was the Philokalia and the Bible, and he was on the road for years, and that's all he that's all he was reading. So, yeah, I, I just um, yeah, do nothing carelessly, you know, and uh, knowledge of your actions and knowledge of truth. That seems to be the big message from that book. Um, and again, four virtues, self-mastery, courage, wisdom and righteousness. And, you know, the qualities that you think are most needed today, really, in a way. Yes. But, um, uh, yeah, a merciful person is a physician to their own soul. There's another uh, saying from that book, you know, I can't remember which monk said that now, but it, it reminded me of the Red Book where Jung said, um, only those that know the lowest in themselves are capable of great mercy. And so again, it shows that real depth of encounter. Mm. Yeah. I liked what you wrote, a wonderful psycho-spiritual observation in the book points out that each of us judges others according to our own character. <laughs> that pulls you up short. <laughs> it does, it does, because we've all got the judgment, haven't we? Absolutely, and, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Jung would call that a shadow projection. Yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it's a really contemporary book, I think. You know, you read it. If you've got the idea that you're interested in sort of attending to the soul and being, you know, when you hear things in the book, like there comes a point where the, where the heart is taught by the spirit in secret. You're talking about something that's just like, wow, this is not just willy-nilly stuff that is shared in the collective every day these are these people were you know they were deeply devoted to that you know and that something's taught in secret by the spirit you, you, you're now being sort of inducted in this yeah. way god i love that you know i absolutely love that yeah so book number 10 mm. padre pio the two story pio. oh yeah wow <laughs> so I've been reading about Padre Pio for some time now. Um, uh, there was a by McCarthy or the, something like that, his name, I can't remember now, uh, about Padre Pio. And I read it and I thought, is this a work of fiction? I couldn't really work out what was going on because he's talking about him bilocating all around the world, turning up in New York in, in his sandals and blessing people, knocking on people's doors and blessing someone who's dying, giving them the last rites. What? And um, I, and then I found this really authoritative um, piece written by um, Ruffin, and uh, and I thought right, this one's regarded as a very well researched piece of work, so I thought I'll go to that. And I started reading it, and I <laughs> thought, you know, this is quite a quite a journey that um, Padre Pio has been on. It, it's very evident that you know from an early age he was a very holy person, and you get all the overtones of um the the great mystics of Teresa of Avila and yeah. you know, Hildegard and in this contemporary 1960s chap who's now got this these five wounds that have bled for 50 years and he could read souls and uh you know would sort of start to uh tell people what they'd left out and what they hadn't brought to confession and um <laughs> You know, he'd say, he said, take, he'd say things like, well, take me from, um, yeah, 1953 onwards. He said, that's when it's important. <laughs> you think, cool, that's detailed. Um, so I really love reading that because it now started to make me think, wow, there's another level here. You know, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Imagine going to confession with him and him saying, come on, that's not half of it. <laughs> Tell me the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I must admit, I've I had the heebie-jeebies thinking about that because I thought, yeah. can you imagine even what it's like? In fact, that they used to do it um, in a line, not in a booth. He just had a chair in a room. Obviously, there was a bit of distance; you couldn't hear what's going on. But some people would break ranks and leg it, you know, in a in a cold sweat. But this isn't in this book. But um, one of the one of the books I read. Um, it's a really tragic story, but it's got a beautiful outcome. Was there was a man that was um, having an affair, and 
you know, imagine Italy in the 1950s or whatever. And he had this gruesome idea that he would kill his wife so he could be with his lover, you know. And I mean, unbeknown to him, she was a serious devotee of Padre Pio. And she said, oh, I'm going to go to San Giovanni Rotunda this weekend to see Padre Pio. And he didn't know anything about him and said, I'll come with you. Because he, in his mind, he thought that'll make it look like I'm a nice guy going to church. <laughs> so anyway, he walked in the room and Padre Pio took one look at him, stopped what he was doing. He was doing confessions. He did it about 10 hours a day, I think. He stood up, grabbed hold of him and said, get out your hands stink of blood and threw him out of the out of the church anyway the guy went into a meltdown because he realized he'd been rumbled and he crawled back on his knees you know very typical of padre pio he just said come here and then he gave him you know, and he and he was very kind and loving to him and said now don't live your life like that you know so he was really tough but he was very once people got the lesson um Changed, changed the guy's life. And uh, the, the other story that's in this book is um, a, because people got very fa- infatuated with Padre Pio. I mean, he's getting 5,000 letters a day and, you know, <laughs> people would <laughs> have scissors and cut pieces off his robe when he was walking off with to do the mass. They'd be trying to cut bits of so that they have a relic, you know. Yeah. And he, oh, he was, anyway, they put a policeman in to help out with the crowd control. <laughs> And um, there was this young policeman and he said, you come back to my room. He said, I need to have a word with you. So the policeman came back and he said, listen, prepare yourself. Because he said, in eight days, you'll be dead. And the policeman said, but he said, our oh, father, he said, I'm, I'm very healthy. He said, there's nothing wrong with it. He said, don't worry, you'll be a lot better next week. <laughs> Which, you know, and the guy went off and put his house in order, told everyone and then just died uh, as, as predicted extraordinary he told um archbishop i think marcini that he would be pope in five years and he said prepare yourself you'll be pope in five years and they went oh these mystics and then he was you know he became pope paul the (laughs) sixth i just i think what is happening with that yeah Uh, and i suppose the question is for me i'm always interested in the farther reaches of our human potential so what is it then where where's the where are we going with this? And that fascinates me, you know. Mm. <laughs> so, you yeah. That this, this book still reverber- reverberates in your life and your soul. Very much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've got uh, I've got little pictures of Padre Pio all over the place, you know, because uh, I just, I feel very uh, connected. connected. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. Have I you noticed more. anything happening in your life since you've been putting those pictures everywhere? Uh, ooh, that's a good question um not not to the point where it's sort of like no kind of divine things but but i tell you what i have noticed is a lot more truth telling to to myself because he was he's regarded as the saint of the confession <laughs> <laughs> so you I just, can't lie to yourself with him around <laughs> no exactly so it does make you want to go in a bit and think right i better have a little look in there um but yeah, there's just something I just love reading about him because he was a tough cookie. I mean, he didn't hold back. You know, he was no lightweight. He really told people what was going on. But he had tremendous compassion, you know. And it, it like the idea, I know these days people say, oh, I don't like the word sin. And I mean, you get a different sense of it with him. He says, it's just the betrayal of love. He said, sometimes we're just not putting. So you read Marion Williamson about, you know, ask for a miracle and put love first and Padre Pio is saying the same or when you miss the mark which is the meaning of the word sin you're just actually losing out on love Mm -hmm. Uh, so I kind of I I always put things I read in the context of others as well because it triangulates a bit Um, but yeah I I, I just love that you know and yeah that, that, that there's this call for love and this call for you know, real surrender uh, to God, I guess. That would be, you know, whatever or whoever God is. <laughs> I don't, um, um, Julian of Norwich has said God, God is mother and father and uh, Teresa of Avila said God is love, you know. So we've all got this different... Yeah. Take. Yeah. But I, I, like, I like the sentiment, you know, that, yeah. 
So tell me, I mean, that's the 10th book. You um, alluded earlier uh, before we came on air that there was an 11th. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes on that one. Normally you can't have an 11th. But... Well, um, this is uh, Brother Herbert Caden, who is, um, who is 101 years old. He's a Benedictine monk. And for the last 26 years, we've been going to this monastery for little retreats at Advent. And they do Buddhist and Christian retreats. Well, they did. And Enneagrams. They're quite progressive. Um, and I, I you sort of befriended, uh, you know, Brother Herbert. He, he, in fact, I've got to go again because he lent me a book on reincarnation that I've got to give him, give him back. <laughs> and uh, about Lama Yeshi's reincarnation, oddly enough. Um, and yeah, Brother Herbert was... Uh, Grew up in Germany in the 1920s, uh, half Jewish, you know, saw Hitler up close in Munich uh, and Berlin or um, I can't remember the other place. But anyway, saw him a few times, um, not in his uniform, but just out walking with his dogs, you know, and, in, and going off on a rant when his dogs attack some Dobermans. Um, he talks fondly about those things. But, you know, you get this real chilling sense in his book, um, which is. It is on Amazon, actually. Um, some memories of my life, Brother Herbert Caden. And you get the, his best friend was in the Hitler Youth. You, you don't read these things in you know, normal discourse. You think there was a big divide, but he said, well, no. He said that it was a bit like, you know, they, they could still be friends with these kids. So he was, he says it wasn't quite always as split as you think. Obviously, this was before it got really bad. So, you know, but uh, his friend, uh, yeah, Casper Fowl. I think his name was, was was in that. But I think a lot of them just joined because everybody else did, but they still remain friends. Um, but it's a tragic story in that his, um, his mum was a scholar of Meister Eckhart. She ended up working for Wittgenstein. She was his typist when she left Nazi Germany and went to work in Cambridge for Wittgenstein. She was his typist and they got on very well. Uh, he was reading, he was writing Tractatus, the one revision of that at the time. Um, then uh, he then was interred uh, because he was a German citizen. So he then got put in a, a camp, a British camp, which he, wasn't a very nice experience. Uh, then he had a breakdown and was in Fallbourne Hospital in Cambridge and eventually uh, went to Prinish Abbey where B. Griffiths was and became a monk. And he's still going now. What a beautiful soul he is. You know, I, um, I wrote about him in one of my books. That he's such a so unassuming and so humble, um, but what what a life he's lived. There's he, no animosity, no difficulties. He just said, that's what it was, you know? And he said, I remember the time the Gestapo came to see my mum and first time they were all in their uniform and really harsh. And the second time uh, he, came, he came in his civilians, the Gestapo guy and, and addressed his mother with respect. And, you, you know, he said there was some real idiosyncrasies that you just, wouldn't imagine in that time you know um but they managed to get out and they lost everything they just left with what they had in their hands but lucky then they got out but um what a story <laughs> uh real amazing book so thank you for letting me say that because um you know i hope people do go and get it and read it it's quite a story so tell us now a little bit we're kind of running a bit late tell us a little bit about your own books I mean you've written three books yeah. the unselfish spirit human yes. evolution in a time of global crisis the visionary spirit awakening the imaginal realm in the transformer scene age and the restorative spirit illuminating the soul in a time of global awakening yeah so they're all about um, working through deep psychic processes and experiences and taking the transpersonal seriously. So I call it making the trans, making, getting personal about the transpersonal is what is one of my mottos. Um, and they're all about, let, let's look at that there's something that we now know is trying to happen in the field, an awakening or whatever we want to call it. And I'm really interested in um, pl a pluralistic approach. So not one approach or another, but um, held together by people like Jung and some transpersonists who are giving us, as I've shown tonight, some interesting ways into that domain and how we can engage our, our, the shift within, even with some of the wobbles that will happen. So the book is about, um, that's the first book. The second book is a bit more about confronting the shadow, the sacred feminine, um, 
Daemonic Fate, Angelic Destiny is one of the chapters. So, you know, we're all got to dance with the daemon that's going to come to us. Like my experience in the monastery was a bit daemonic. Mm -hmm. um, but there's an angelic destiny there too. You know, you've got to work through that and grow. And, you know, that's how it is. And it doesn't have to be extreme for everybody. It's extreme for some. I think the more of us that are doing the work, the less extreme it becomes a bit for others potentially because consciousness is, you know, there's a, a receptivity in, in the field for that. And the final one is about um, the interface between, so the restorative spirit is the interface between transpersonal consciousness and moral conscience and using a lot of near-death stuff. So uh, using Penny Sartori, Bruce Grayson, Howard Storm and people like that um, to look at some of those processes about where we might need to do some atonement work and some forgiveness work um, that could be part of the process so they're a trilogy and yeah I mean I just had to write them you know I'm not going to do any more that's it <laughs> you're not going to write any more books no no I I just want to practice now and just you know I, I think if I could I mean I'm married and I've got grandchildren so I'm not going to go and do this but I feel more like leaning into monasticism now that's and just being quiet and just yeah you know it's been a it's been a wild ride <laughs> and, uh i just want to just integrate what i've been through and i want to i've written the books but i've got to catch up with them i i'm not writing from a position that you know i've got something that i, I i'm i've got to do that work yeah but that feels to me really important and i'm 66 so sorry 65 66 this year so, you know, I think, yeah, while I'm fit and healthy, I want to get into doing some real practice and maybe run some workshops, uh, doing a dream body workshop with a, an ex-Buddhist uh, nun friend of mine, Pema. She's, we're doing a dream body yoga workshop together, um, doing a couple of days, at one in Cambridge and, you know, various things, maybe public speaking, but nothing too exotic. <laughs> Just something, not, yeah, it's sort of, every day and you know just maybe every couple of months do a little something yeah mm. yeah so that feels like the, interesting the, the, most people who write books don't want to stop yeah i found it really painful if i'm honest it, it's, it's so why did you do it Pardon? why did you do it because i i felt it was a way of completing what i started with that spiritual crisis right and i felt that what i'd come through and the way i was connecting with the world and the land and people i thought well that's my offering uh, from my experience and it's you know it's just a very partial view it, it's not for everyone and i appreciate that um but i had to do it but it took me 12 years i mean four years each book you know because there's a lot of research in them you know i've used a huge amount of references there's, 18 pages of references at point eight on one of the books 14 pages of references it's a lot of what and so i just thought yeah i don't really have anything more to say either i think uh i just want to get into practice you know it's a wise man who knows when he's got nothing more to say yeah I, I, yeah exactly i i think I, I think you know if i wrote a book it'd be contrived yeah. Uh, those three were in me and I had to get them out because I was pressured to I felt the the urge to do it um it don't get me right it wasn't a horrible experience I mean it's it's really engaging and and really interesting but the time it took was like yeah oh, I thought this is you know actually yeah and, and you're in your head a lot and I wanted to be more in my heart you know and um so yeah I think I think the next few well whatever how long ever we've got we don't know do we I uh, keep thinking about death. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and preparing for death and, and doing some workshops, but quite gentle, well-being stuff, you know, not gonna, nothing too extreme. Yeah. So tell our viewers where they can contact you if they wish to. Yeah, um, I've got a website called <clears throat> Transformer Scene. <laughs> so a bit of a mouthful, but um, it's Transformo, with an O, and then Scene, C-E-N-E. So www.transformerscene.co.uk. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not a lot on there. It's a couple of pages, but, um, you know, I, I sort of went a bit minimalist on that. <laughs> well, Mick Collins, thank you for adding your 10 best list to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. 
I've enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you very much. Ah, you're welcome. You. So, as the spiritual book market becomes increasingly crowded, it is challenging to sort the wheat from the chaff, which is why we launched the No BS Spiritual Book Club, so we could provide you with trusted recommendations from people who've walked this path before you. You can check out our free 10 Best Spiritual Books archive, which is ever-growing, at the nobsspiritualbookclub.com, where you can also view previous episodes of this interview series, and you can add your name to our Save My Space list to get last-minute reminders of upcoming episodes. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of the No BS Spiritual Book Club's 10 Best Interviews. Till then, it's goodbye from me. And thank you, Nick Collins. Lovely. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who watched. Thank you very much. <laughs>